And so one of the things that, uh, that was recently, was, I read just shortly, and we know this from our founding fathers. They say without faith in God, without religion, our form of government and any form of government will fail. And, uh, and so, uh, quoting a Fulbright scholar, a Harvard professor, Clay Christensen, he said, if you take away religion, you cannot hire enough police. And it's true. I mean, we got evil in the world. And it's signs of the end times. Jesus is coming back. But you know, we're not to be fearful. God spoke to me uh, early on because we were looking at building a building, which is the third, second, third, and fourth phase out here. I don't remember, about 60-something thousand square feet of a master plan when we bought here of a four phase. This is the phase one that we're in. When we open up that, it'll be two, three, and four. We did them all at once. And uh, in the time when all this was going on, there were people a little fearful and you know, concerned, you know, what's going to happen to the economy and all that. And so I prayed and I sought the Lord. And the Lord told me this. He says, tell the people, because I'm coming back soon, and I believe he's coming back soon, and we should live like that. Get right with God. Stay right with God. Don't back up. Don't pause. Take that gospel and go. I haven't changed my mind about the mission to go into the world. Take it. The world needs hope like never before. And when trouble comes, people hit the bottom. They're going to look up. And I'm going to send them in. And you're going to give them the gospel. And you're going to give them the hope of Jesus. So don't shrink back. Move forward and don't be afraid. So that's what we've done. And that's what I, we're going to do. Because I know Jesus is coming soon. But listen. He didn't say go into the, down the mountains and hide when hard things come. And no. He, he never. He said don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I thought about the possibility of us not being able to pay the building off. And what I thought was, well, the church isn't the building anyway. We can still meet. We'll just redo it. No big deal. I'm not going to back up. And second thing is it dawned on me. So I asked the bank. I said, what's going to happen if, we, if this economy goes to horrible and we can't pay? He said, well, last thing we're going to do is foreclose on a church, you think we're going to do it? We're not going to do that. What are, we, what are we going to do with it anyway? So I said, that's good because it's a Christian bank. You know, I mean, the owners, they have a Christian mission. I didn't tell you this, but Iowa State Bank, I will tell you this. The last time when we built this building, three times they came to us unsolicited and lowered our interest rates as interest rates going down. That's the type of people they are. Good bank, Iowa State Bank. All right, there's other good banks, I know. So if you work at another bank, don't get all offended and, you know. Oh, I'm so unoffendable that I can't think of what offends people, so I just offend people right and left. Now, I st those of you visiting, I, I started a church 32 years ago here, and I don't let myself preach much because I've gotten old and I say anything. And that mean, there's things that come out of my mouth. I go, what? They said, what did you say? I said, I shouldn't have said that. So I don't do it very often. But every once in a while, when nobody else wants to preach, they let me preach. So this is it. So I didn't know what I was going to preach till Thursday. I was praying and God finally gave it to me. Okay. Right? So that's important to remember. The other thing is, Pastor Brian, when he knows I'm preaching, he goes out of town. Brian, where are you? <laughs> I know you. Anyway, so today the Lord gave me this, this, uh, this passage, Matthew 16. The title of the message is, I'll, I will build my church. Where Jesus said, I'll build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 13 to 20, we start and we read there. New Living Translation, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, they told Jesus. Some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, isn't that weird? Like, you mean he came back from the dead? They're saying, you're who? You're Jeremiah? <laughs> Come on. It's kind of nuts, isn't it? Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter answered, Simon Peter, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now look what Jesus said, verse 17. He replied, you're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Let me tell you, when, when God reveals Jesus by his spirit to you, it's a work of God. You, you, you're not good enough or smart enough to figure out that he's the Messiah and the only one. To believe what the Word says. It's a whole work of the Holy Spirit. And if you come to Jesus Christ and realize you need to confess your sins, and repent from your sins, and turn from your sins, and live for Jesus, and walk with Jesus, and be alive in Jesus, then that's done by the Spirit. And so uh, Peter, Peter, Peter realized that. 
And he was, he, he's one of the first that goes, look, I know who you are. You're Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the Son of God. You're the Savior. I know who you are. And it was that testimony that from that moment forward that Jesus built his church. Because Jesus said, now I'll say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I'll build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you forbid on earth be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit on earth be permitted in heaven. And then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. They don't tell them. Isn't it funny that they didn't know it after he was killed? When all the prophecies from Passover, you, I mean, all of that stuff, how did they not know? Well, don't be judging them because if you was back there, you might not know either. There's signs all around us right now that Jesus would come back any time. So get right, stay right, okay? Because you're going, you got to be ready, but don't be afraid. Be excited. It's okay. I mean, the devil's been working a long time to try to bring down this world so, so he can rule the world. He loves religion, the devil does, because he he's going to set himself up as God in the Jerusalem and demand everybody bow down and worship him, okay? And so... Don't, don't be worried. The devil's doing this. When God, when God allows it, this is all going to come to pass. The people are going to be caught up to heaven. We're going to have trouble on earth. There's going to be a great tribulation, big problems, and man, oh, man. In the meantime, like, don't be afraid, you know. Remember 11 of the 12 disciples were martyred, like killed? They were died young because they stood up for Jesus. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to stand there. I said a long time ago, I'll probably go to prison because I'm not going to quit preaching what the Bible says about morality. Go ahead and put me in prison. I'll preach to them in there. God opens the prison doors for Peter. He can open them up for me. Right? All right. Enough of that. That wasn't in my notes. I've been talking about one world government and one world monetary system over in my class back here on Revelation the last couple of weeks. And it's going to happen, folks. You know, the, 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 they, they met this past week. And there's a push by people from all the different nations. Because you always think you know better and you give me, I have the answers. And together we will fix all the world's problems. So the World Health Organization met. And the plan was to relinquish, by some of our leaders, to relinquish ourselves to them to rule over us. Well, God has said, he set us free. We have freedom of worship. I'm thankful. We have freedom to speech. I'm thankful. We have freedom, freedom of press. I'm thankful. We have freedoms. And you know what? Jesus is the first one that gave freedom because it says the, whom the Lord has set free. He's free indeed. And it doesn't matter. The, the believers that followed Jesus in their early days, they were free, even though they were under Roman government. And Jesus left the earth. And it was 35 years later, the Romans were killing Christians and Jews. And the Masada thing happened. He never got rid of the Romans. He was born under Roman rule. He died under Roman rule. Let me tell you something. You can be on the outside a slave of a system or whatever, but on the inside, we're free. No one's going to enslave us. You can put me in prison, but I'm free. I'm not going to let that eat my brain up. I'm going to be free, and I'm going to stay free. So today, I'll build my church. Let me tell you something. The first thing I want you to see is I, I want to boast in the Lord. I'm here to boast in the Lord. I feel like the foolish and the weak that God mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26, because I started the church and, I, and I, I was afraid. I was scared to death to start the church. Pastor, uh, uh, I, I'd been filling four or five years and we were going to move to Kansas City. And somebody said, no, we need a church. So they taught me in the staying here to start a church. And I thought, I don't want it to be about me because, and I was scared, but I knew I was supposed to do something. So between Yulstead and Charles Crabtree, Pastor Yulstead, who was the superintendent of Charles Crabtree and Pastor Weeks, I finally had the guts to do it. In fact, Pastor Weeks pushed me toward this building over here we started in. He's the one that found it, him and Yulstead. They said, hey, little church, you should go. I said, oh, I'm not ready. I'm, I was scared. I'm going to leave my job. I wasn't going to get paid anything. And, I'm scared. And he said, no. He said, you need to go drive by there. He said, I believe that God's got a work to do there. I think it's a good, good opportunity. So uh, finally, after he like almost, you know, he, I finally drove by. And when I did, the Holy Spirit came over and I just began to weep. And I knew I was supposed to do it, but I was still scared. So out of desperation and fear, I fasted for four days. God spoke to me a bunch of stuff in that four days. 
And that some of the things that are already is in my heart, I was very insecure. I couldn't organize. I couldn't preach. I never preached much. It's a lot. I don't have a lot of giftings. But God said to me, uh, I'll build my church. That's the title. And the gates of hell and upper. I will build the church. It's my church. I will build it. All I need is a pastor. And I heard it with pleading. All I need is a pastor. I've called you. Be, you just be a pastor. Don't worry about the rest. I'll bring people around you to help you do the rest. Don't try to do something you don't know. Don't pretend you know because they'll watch you fail. Just admit your weaknesses and go on. Because I choose the weak to confound the strong and the foolish to confound the wise. As our scripture says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26. And I read. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world and things counted as nothing at all and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. And as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. So I'm telling you, God hates it when you start talking about this church and talk about the pastors. Stop it. Talk about Jesus. You hear me? Don't elevate us. You're setting us up for the devil to knock us off with the shotgun. We, we are nothing. We're just human flesh, weak. Okay? I mean, I know Pastor Hill over here, he's pretty, he's getting older as pressure. He's, he's looking older <laughs> now that he's running things. But it's not, it's not you. You know that. In fact, when Pastor Jeff, I said, you ready to lead? He said, well, I don't have any desire to do it. I love that. I'm willing if that's what you think. I said, I think you're the right guy. Well, okay, I'll try. We'll see how it goes. Amen. And then after being here 20 years, he got 99 plus percent of the vote as the next pastor. That doesn't happen. In fact, I couldn't get 99 percent of the vote to stay on stage. Some of you vote me out. Some of you online, you vote me right out of here. I'm voting myself out. As a result, verse 29, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God had made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. Thank you. The Lord for that. He made us right with God. Jesus did that. He made us pure and holy and freed us from sin. You know, people can put on a suit. This doesn't make me holy. This is just what I grew up with. What I I'm going to be myself because God said, be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. I didn't call that one or this one. I was intimidated. He said, just be real. You're a little weird. People will, will follow you because you're real. So just be yourself. Don't change. Be yourself. So this is me. You know, some people's idea of holiness is a suit. Well, it's not. Some of you, your idea of holiness is jeans with holes in them, but it's not. You're not holy wearing them jeans with them holes in them. That's just kind of stupid. <laughs> I don't mind being, I'm stupid sometimes. It's okay. So therefore, as it says in Scripture, verse 31, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. In other words, that no flesh could boast, only boast in Jesus. Jesus has done it. This church was a hand of God, miracle after miracle, made this happen. And I'm not talking about the buildings. I'm talking about the fellowship of believers. Because church isn't a song and a sermon. It's a fellowship. And let me tell you something. We need to connect with one another. We're building this fellowship area. And we're going to have a lot of opportunities for you to build group relationships. Because let me tell you, church isn't online. You go try to call those guys online. You watch and listen to their false doctrine, a lot of them. You go on and just call them up when you have somebody die when you got a little marital problem you got a little need for this a little need you're sick you call them up they're not going to answer so as God's given the local church he's given pastors because pastors pray for you and encourage you it's relational in this church he told me all I need is you to be a pastor well I knew what that meant because that's my calling and I didn't want to have it in fact Austin you'll tell him it's so hard I tried to talk to him out of it from the time he was a teen I said don't do it boy it'll kill you it'll hurt you I said unless you can't do anything else don't you dare do it he went and did it doesn't listen to his daddy, must have listened to God. Now I'm about as gifted as a donkey. But Jesus can build his church. I mean, you know, you can look it up, Numbers 22, verse 21. I'm not going to read it in this service. 
But Balaam is being hard-headed, and a donkey talks to him. There's a big angel there. The donkey can see it. Balaam's blind. Just like sometimes, we're blind. We don't see what God's doing. So here are the lessons from a donkey you read from that passage. Number one, a lesson from a donkey. Open your eyes. And I pray your eyes are open. Verse 31 of uh, Numbers 22. Number two, get on your face before God like Balaam did when he saw that he was wrong and his sin. Get on your face before God. Number three, do what Balaam did. Confess and repent and obey. Verse 34, Numbers 22. If you're taking notes, it's good. Number four, I pray you say only what God gives you to say. Say only what God wants you to say. So many times we run our mouth. You know, one of the things is running our mouth. I, I, I sometimes open my mouth, put my foot in there. Man, I'm telling you, I'm going to look stupid. I'm like, come on. Sometimes my son's the only one that'll like tell me the truth. Well, my wife, she likes to do that too. But, you know, I mean, sometimes we just need someone to get in our face and say, hey, what are you, be careful what you're saying. That's why I said, I, I realize I go back and listen to things I preach and I go, I don't think I should be preaching. They wanted me to preach. So I prayed. I got something here. I did okay in the first service. Pastor Jeff, I asked him, I said, did I say something stupid? He said, not that I can think of. <laughs> I said, well, I'm planning on it in this service. Do only what God wants you to say. Get, say what God wants you to say. And the fifth thing, in verse number 37, respond to God's urgent invitation. And it also says that God will richly reward you when you do these things. So open your eyes. Get on your face before God. Confess, repent, and obey. Say only what God wants you to say. And respond to God's urgent invitation. Let me tell you something. Lessons from a donkey are good ones. I felt like I'm that way. But if we do that stuff, God takes the weak to confound the wise. Like, you know, like there is no way this could ever happen because of me. I, I, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know how it happened. I'm being honest. In fact, God said to me, don't you go around telling people how to grow a church and win people and all that. He said, don't do that because you don't know what you're doing. Remember I told you you can't organize your way out of a wet paper bagger and can't preach. You don't have very many other gifts. All I needed was a pastor. I just need you to love them and pray for them. Be there for them. Be a pastor. So I try to hire pastors because I think that's important. That's our DNA. And today I'm putting down a stake to remember what God has done and in the future that from this day forward that all of our pastors and all you people that don't know remember it's about Jesus first others second and you don't even matter you'll be taken care of that's joy Jesus first others second and then you so remember God did it second thing God did it God did it God did it and so in Joshua 4 Speaking of donkeys, one of our youth pastor donkeys talked to me, gave me this scripture. I'm not going to mention Zach's name. But anyway, he didn't know what he was saying. But it like was exactly as I was sharing with him what I was going to call. It's like it just, boom, hit me. He said, yeah, share this. Joshua 4, 1 to 8, New Living Translation. When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from each tribe, the meaning of the tribe of Israel. Tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. God had dried up the Jordan. They were going across with the Ark of the Covenant. He says, each one of them grab a stone. Carry them out and pile them up to the place where you will camp tonight. Last time we went to Israel, we went there. We went right where they crossed the Jordan. We went right where the place is still commemorated today and tourists go there because they still remember. So take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of Jordan and carry them out and pile them up as a place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of Jordan in front of the ark of your Lord God. Each of you must pick one stone and carry it out on your shoulder, 12 stones in all, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? So today, I'm marking after 22 years, 32 years, I mean, 32 I'm, giving, I'm helping you remember. We remember the Lord in communion. We remember the Lord. It's symbolic here, water baptism. Okay? The Israelites were told over and over, remember. It says, teach your children. Tell them what the history was. Don't let them forget. Teach them. And I'm telling you that this church 
God's going to do it again. That song we sang, that said about the faithfulness of God, and it's the same God was done af before, and they had already practiced before I even knew what I was preaching. I said, what do you want to do for the false closing song? We got this new one. Would that be good? I said, hmm, goes perfect. Because the same God for 32 years that has saved people, baptized people. One time we had 70 people in one service baptized in the Holy Spirit. One time we had 50 people saved all the point. For eight years people got saved every Sunday, not rededicated, first time conversions. And today, almost every Sunday in one of the services, someone comes to Jesus. Either here, also in the youth group. Last time I was there, there were 400 teenagers in there. I'm going to tell you, God is afoot. He's moving and he's going to do it again. He's the same God of the Israelites of the Old Testament, the New Testament, of the beginning of this church and any other church that's true of following Jesus and being the church God's called us to do. And God is the one that gets all the glory. No one else would boast. And then he said in verse 7, then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the ark of the Lord's covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. I believe this is the most important message I've ever preached in my life. It's a memorial to remember. Okay, and it's, it's long. I don't care what you think about that. Okay, don't be leaving early on me. I'm watching you. If I don't know your name, I may go, hey you! Unless you got to go to work. I won't do that really. So anyway, so the men did as Joshua had commanded them. They took the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River. One for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua to do. And they carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. So, all I'm saying is, guys, I'm going to bring up miracles. Miracles that have happened in this church. And uh, there's many miracles that are personal with you that you've had throughout your life. Your salvation, if you're truly born again just by the Spirit, that's a miracle. The greatest miracle. So I was going to go to Kansas City because for four or five years I felt led to start a church. I'll go to Kansas City and do it. But the superintendent at the time, who the late Reverend Yulstead, said, no, we need a church here. Pastor Weeks, who I worked for at Brian, said, hey, you need to do it. So they were looking. They found this little building over here. We started in and seated about 140. And uh, Charles Crabtree also said, he, I, when I was in Des Moines, I wanted a church in Herbert. I bought land and my brother sold it. He said, you need to start a church. I had that conversation with him. He was behind me. I had three people really believe in me, those three. My wife didn't believe in me, not at that point. I don't think I told her because I was scared to tell her what I was thinking. But actually, one of the miracles is that when I said I was going to do it, she said, do it. And she supported us because I didn't have a salary. I made very little for 10 years. That's a miracle. Anybody's got a wife, you know, uh, okay, she was behind me, right? So when we got ready to start it, you know, Pastor Weeks had found this little building over here because they, Brother Yostead wanted to do something on the west side. He found this little building, and, and I'd been feeling led for several years to start a church, and it was a very serious decision. And I, I like to say, when he said, go look at this building, I said, uh, I don't know about that. And I was nervous. I was afraid. I was scared. I was weak, you know, and and. Pastor Wheat said, do it. And he just pushed me. He said, it's a great opportunity. Go drive by it. Finally, I said, okay. You know, he told me about 10 times. And, you know, he don't, I don't remember if he put his fist like he did sometime with me, trying to knock me in the head to get some sense in me. But anyway, I, I came over here and drove by. When I drove by that building, seated 140 comfortably, we crammed over 200 in there. And I remember people sitting with their knees right here on the front and me preaching like this. And have them saying S's, I spit, and that spit went pew. And one time it was so visible that it landed on Kristen Blackman. Everybody froze, and I went, ooh, sorry, would you like a towel? Everybody cracked up. But we had them jammed in there. It was illegal. I mean, literally. And there wasn't that many people, but it didn't seat very many. And so that's what ended up happening. But anyway, the Lord was speaking to me to, to do this. And finally, I drove by, and I was moved by the Holy Spirit, and I was still scared. I didn't have much confidence. And I prayed and fasted for four days, not because I was spiritual, because I was scared to death. And the Lord said, you need to move from Ankeny, where I love my house. I paid $20,000 more for the house we bought over here in Urbandale, because he said, if you're going to start a church there, you need to be part of the community. Sell that house and get over there. Well, you, there's another miracle. I'm not going to tell you how quick a house sold and get in this house. We found the house. We moved over here. 
So then I didn't, make, I didn't make that much money for 10 years. Let me tell you this miracle. After a few years, God doubled, more than doubled my wife's salary to give her another job. And she had that job for 10 years. And she made what we were making together. God is no debtor. That's a miracle. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you. She had the job almost 10 years. I didn't realize that as it was happening. It was several years later when it dawned on me that God has been faithful. I was like looking around and God said, remember this? I did that. I said, oh, wow. That was incredible. But Jesus said, I will build my church. We, were, we had this little building. We finally bought it. And I said, okay. I fasted and prayed for four days. I was up there. I was, I was shingling. I was up there shingling because that, that thing needed a lot of work. Pastor Kerry, he painted inside and out. Uh, he was a painter. At the time, we had a, a group of about 17. They were all like brand people and came over and helped. I don't remember exactly. But it's about that counting, counting Dale and Madeline, Susan and I, and our, our youngest, our oldest children. And, and we had this conversation, a great conversation of faith. I said to Dale, I said, Dale, I said, uh, uh, I'm not going to give up for five years. If we don't reach 50 by five years, I'm going to close the door. I don't want my kids to grow up in a little bitty church. And then later I thought, man, that wasn't faith. I'm just believing God for 50 and five years. But then later it dawned on me that was faith because I was willing to not give up for five years, even if I don't have 50. And I, God didn't care about that. He, he, he uses donkeys. He just said, hey, you. So anyway, started there, we're working, my wife, and I gave money to remodel it. It was $20,000 total remodeling. We didn't have any money. I didn't, I wasn't promised any salary. No other church helped us. Brian gave us tables and chairs to get us started. They paid my salary as I was getting going for a couple months and was supported by us. And the blood came from there that helped me, the seed. So, so thankful for that. But... We had, my, my in-laws had given money, my, my parents had given money, a few friends had given money, and we had about 15,000 to make the place like presentable, because it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. You can ask Pastor Kerry. Uh, he, you know, I was his youth pastor when I had hair back in Sheldon. Do you know that? Back then, he was weird. He hides his weirdness. Take him out to eat and give him a little pizza. He'll get weird on you. So anyway. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm like working away and we're like 5,000 short to pay the bills that we got going. And about that time, David and Janice Mishik, who I administered to before, had his father, Dr. Mishik, Charles Mishik, his wife is Janice. Janice is still alive. Dr. Mishik wasn't going to church. He didn't go to church. Later, he started coming to our church several years later. He shows up because his son, who I administered to, had told him about the starting of the church. And he had a heart for God, but he never was part of a church. And I'm up there singling, and he showed up and said, are you Pastor Weaver? I said, yeah. He said, uh, uh, can I talk to you? I said, okay. So I came down the letter. He said, I got a check for you. And he said, I, I just felt led to give you this amount. And I mean, we were $5,000 short of that 20. He had a check for $5,000. I mean, you talking about a miracle? I about ripped, I about... I mean, I'm telling you, if I'd have been old, it'd have been something run down my leg right about then. Now you know why they don't let me preach. But let me tell you something. What has happened in building, not buildings, but a fellowship, is not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus, about God's Spirit. And I was praying, Lord, how in the world I'm starting a church I, at the time, I had no people. This is before anybody had said they are going to come help me. And I was starting to, I said, how do I keep it from being about me when I'm the only one there is? How are people not going to look at me? It's not about me. I don't want it ever to be about me. And I don't want to grow old and then the church fall apart because I'm not there because it is about me. So the Lord said, well, if you want it to be their church, people have keys to their houses and they clean their houses. We have 96,000 square feet. I said, okay, hundreds of people have keys. And never once have we had anything stolen because of that. And 96,000 square feet in this building and that building is cleaned by volunteers. Now that's a miracle. All I did was hear God and do what he said to do, and it's weird. A few years later, about five years before we moved over here, God said, 
This church is going to be too much about you. you got too much personality. People are following you. I don't like it, and I don't like it around the world. I don't like people following man. I'm, I'm a jealous God. I want to follow about Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. He said, I want you to start using other people and develop them. I told Jeff about it. I started using him a little bit. We started using other people, and then we go. He said, hey, these young guys can learn. Teach them. Disciple them. Look at their sermons. Tell them when they're good. Tell them when they're bad. Tweak them. Do whatever you need to do and start using everybody. Not everybody liked it, but you know what? I don't just do everything everybody says because I heard God say to me, quit making it about a man. Everybody can preach and nobody knows who to follow. And some people don't like that. But you know what? I don't want you to follow us. We're ministering to you as pastors. We're following Jesus. This church is about Jesus. And when it's about Jesus, then in you, it's about others. It's not about you. Because Jesus is first and his spirit cares about ministry and everything and anything you can do. No matter whether you're a donkey like me or not, God has something for you to do. So you need to hear it and do it. And then he spoke to me to, to, to make, you know, about the church. He said, he said, babies is the, my heart toward all people. They're totally dependent. I want everybody to depend. He said, when you do ministry, if you don't have enough money for everything, he said, babies are most important than the toddlers, than the elementary, than the middle school, high school. So when we started, I hired two children's pastors before I hired him, and nobody did that. I hired two children's pastors before I hired any other staff because God's heart let the little children come to me. Don't despise them, for such is the kingdom of God. So that was a miracle. God heard that, and guess what? He was right. And, uh, and then he gave me, everybody's doing a vision statement, a mission. What's your vision statement? What's your mission statement? You're going to start a church. Well, you've got to have a vision statement. you got a mission. I said, Lord, I don't know how to do a vision statement. I've seen them. They're like seven pages long. I, mean, I don't know what to do. And the Lord just spoke to me like almost audible. Vision is heaven. Set your affection on things above and on things of the earth. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Right? Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, it's about heaven, being heavenly minded. You know, here's, here's what I've, you've heard me say before. Live for the things money can't buy and death can't take away. It's about eternity. It's about eternal life. It's about heaven. And then the mission. The vision is heaven. Keep your eyes on Jesus. The vision, Hebrews 12. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And then the, the mission is to go there and take as many people with us as possible, both at home and abroad. Make missions important. Do the Great Commission, which is to win the lost, baptize them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then to teach them to observe all the things I command you. So we have Christian education, small groups, teaching, Wednesday night, Sunday school. We need to teach our children systematically because this world, this nation is biblically illiterate. You need to have your kids being taught the Word of God. So those became the key things in being a fellowship, not just having a church service with a sermon and a song, and to be worshipers in spirit and to pray and be a Holy Spirit-filled church. The first type thing I preached was 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians, which I taught on the gifts of the Spirit, the moving of the Spirit, the infilling of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us as a body. I taught that because I believe in the work of the Holy Spirit. He's, he is one of the uh, the, the, he's one of the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God. They're one. So, I just thought I'd point that out. Now, there's a lot more miracles that are coming. Amen. Okay? Hey, did I mention the Kohasso? I did? See, this is why I don't remember if that was early service this or... Okay, I did that. Good. Okay. All right. I'm going to tell you some miracles. The first house we bought was where the gym sits in the student campus. There's a house there. We started the service. There was, we started getting cars. And those people noticed there's a lot of cars. And instead of listing the house, they were moving. They called and said, you want to buy the house? And I said, I don't know. We don't have any money. So I called Vic Mitchell. I said, what should we do? He said, buy it. I said, how are we going to buy it? We don't have any money. Take an offering. I don't remember if we borrowed part of it or what. We took an offering, but we bought it. And then we ended up building that chapel and the gym there. Right? When we first got it, we had youth group in the basement. And then we had classroom up in the living room and classrooms in the bedrooms because we didn't have enough space as we grew. And then the next thing that happened is a house east of that building over there across on Townsend. That house was, uh, had a sign on sale. So I called them and said, hey, I don't know if we, if we have money. I'm interested in buying the house? They said, well, we, we already sold it. We just hadn't put a sold on there. It's sold. It's under contract. I said, okay. So I thought, well, well. Two months later, they called and said, hey, 
that contract fell through that he couldn't get financed and you want to buy it? I went to Vic again. Vic says, yeah, because Vic had more faith than I had. You know, he was a realtor. Anybody that sells real estate has faith. And, and by the way, he did all of our, our, our uh, real estate work for free, never charged a nickel. I said, anyway, I was just going to tell you this. We ended up buying that. And then a long time, I mean, a long time before, before this church, God saw it in the future. Boy, I didn't know anything about it. These people in the neighborhood over here, those little stinkers wouldn't let them put 68th Street through. You know how it comes up off of Meredith? And it, and it comes up here and it hits Townsend and it stops. And then just the other side of our building, it starts up again. The neighbors didn't want 68th Street going through. The other streets go through. Not that. That little strip of land the city owned. It was low. We called it Lake Townsend because when it rained, it filled up with water. Right? My kids are going and splash around in the water. I called the city. We bought it. We needed it. It's, that, that piece of land goes right through the sanctuary we had over there, who's now, it's called the student auditorium. So then we got that. That's a, that's a miracle that God saw in the future. And then there was another house to the east. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the lady, that, the couple that lived there, they'd been there forever. They had no way they were moving. But he died. A little bit later, she called, said, you want to buy it? So they moved it. We bought it. About that time, we were kind of getting full, right? We hadn't built, we're in a church that seats 140, and we're seating 200 in there. So we built this building that seated 400 comfortably, and with aisles, we could seat 440. And they, we, so we built it, we grew up the thing, got the money, and did it. It's the biggest step of faith we ever took. For the amount of money coming in per month and per year, the amount we borrowed was scary. I mean, we would barely make it if you looked at the deal. But we took a step of faith. We just did it. We had to do something. And when we opened up that Easter of 95, Larry Blick said, this thing's too small. I looked at him and thought, you've got to be nuts, man. This thing is not too small. It's big. Well, I never wanted a big church, you know. I thought, this is perfect. 400. See, it's 400, right? Well, guess what? It started growing, started growing, started growing, filled up. That was a problem for me. Well, it really wasn't a problem for me, but it was a problem for our ushers because people would come to the door to get a seat and they'd look in and the usher, there was no seats available. And then the ushers would like move families around and fix things and then they'd go get them to seat them and they were gone because they weren't going to wait around. It's too full. So in an elders meeting, Kirk Weaver was talking, they want me to go to double service. I said, listen, I said, I don't like a big church. I said, I like to know everybody and I want everybody to know me. I said, I like a fel small fellowship. I like that. Kirk said, he hit me right between the eyes. He said, I understand your heart, Pastor. He said, but this whole thing's not about people knowing you, and it's not about you knowing them. It's about people knowing Jesus. So get over yourself. I don't think he said that. I heard that by the Spirit. Because he's nice. So we started second service. Then it filled up. And then we were walking through the foyer like sardines. <laughs> literally, Sunday school would happen. And I mean, literally, and Jeff would block one door. They had to greet him at one door. And I would be over here at this door. They couldn't get out. I mean, literally, the church in the, I mean, they were bumping side to side, front, front and back. I mean, I'm telling you, it's like putting sardines in a can. So that's why we built this great big foyer. We're not going to have a problem with the foyer. Now we got a problem with storage. So we built a zillion amount of storage. This building's got so much storage in it. It's unbelievable. Yeah, this one over here. Because, it's a, it's a, you know, we realize we need that. So as the story goes, we built that sanctuary in 1995. And, uh, and so then, in 99, I was frustrated, 1999. And, and I'm, I'm going to shut down some of this other stuff that I've got in my notes. I've got a lot of stories to tell. But in 99, we had given, in January, the most we'd given the, to missions at that point after nine years was $40,000 in a year. And I was frustrated because I wanted missions to be an important piece. And uh, I went on a missions trip with Sam Johnson to Ethiopia and needed a Bible college. My heart was wrenched, prayed. He challenged us, what could you give? And he was talking about it in a two-year period. And so I was dealing with God on the way back. Finally, God said, I want you to do a $50,000 cash offering and one offering. I said, what? Like, literally, I mean, it was pretty clear. And I, I, uh, I uh, uh, 
you know, I was like, I went to the deacon board. I said, I know this sounds crazy. They go, yeah. I said, but can I do it? Uh, okay. Well, I mean, the worst that can happen, I guess, is you don't get it. I said, okay. So we had asked in January of 99 to save money to pay off that building because I'd figured on the 10-year anniversary, it was my heart, that that building would be paid off. And so I'd ask people in January of 99 to start saving money so that a year and eight months later, we could pay cash and pay off the building. It'd be somewhere I'd figure between $100,000 and $150,000 cash offering. And I said, a miracle. Let's save our money. Well, God said, tell people to give that money to this mission, this Bible college that they've been saving. So the ninth anniversary, which is October, the first Sunday of October in 99, we took an offering for $50,000 for that college that I told them. And Sam Johnson came back in December. Pastor Jeff, can you bring that up here? And he later in December, this was the first Sunday of October, later in December, he showed up with this. Can you zero in on the camera right here? And this is what we gave, 65,000 plus in that one cash offering. That's crazy. Now let me tell you this. From that point, when I announced it from that point, the church started growing and growing and growing. Uh, I can't explain it. Income went up. And we never had to take a miracle offering the 10-year anniversary of 2000 October. In June of 2000, the building was paid for not taking one miracle offering for the building. Because God has the heart for missions. Let me tell you something else. When that happened, it's like somebody pulled the plug and the heart and generosity flowed because last year in all the assemblies of God in the nation, our church gave, was number nine in giving a, a ton of money for missions. And let me tell you something. I don't understand it, but from that point forward, missions giving started going up and up and up, the passion for missions, and we, what's one of our DNAs is to take this gospel all over the world and preach this gospel and to do it right here, home and abroad, home and abroad. So, here we are now with a problem, and in, I forget what year, because we're over there and we're full, and for two years we schemed. How do we make room? And no matter what we did, it caused a problem. We could fix nursery problem, we could fill sanctuary problem, that caused a problem with this area, that area, and tried to figure it out over there. And God woke me up after a couple years and said, are you done? Can you just stop it? I said, I didn't. I said what? He said, scheming to figure out what to do. He said, when the, t now I heard this almost audible. He said, when the time is right, I'll let you know my plan. So I went and told the deacons that were there, I, they know. I said, we're going to quit talking about this because we'd been meeting, talking about it for a couple years and we couldn't figure out what to do. And the pastors, we talked about it all the time, didn't we, Jeff? We couldn't figure, because we had a problem with space over there. With double service, it's crazy. Two years later, I was awake in the night. I had a vision of James River Assembly of God in, in Branson, Missouri, I mean, in Springfield, Missouri. Their youth building is about as far from their main building as that building is over there. And God said, that can be your student campus. And you build over here and buy these houses. Already before God had spoken to me six months to stop by and see Al Carey, he had a tree nursery back here, and he told me, he said, stop by and ask him if he wants to sell his land. I was coming back from lunch with Alan Yulstead, the superintendent at the time. He, was, he, was, he had retired superintendent, was part-time on our staff, and I've been telling all the pastors, right, Jeff? I think, I think God's speaking to me, we need to buy that tree nursery. There's five acres there, and we've been paying 150000 for a third of an acre. So I was there, I said, there's, there's Kerry, I'll carry. I said, I'm going to pull in and ask him if he wants to sell his land. He's going to think I'm crazy. So I pulled in, I told him. He said, well, actually, yeah, I do want to sell my land. I just sold the business to the manager. He bought land out west. He's moving Kerry Tree Nursery out there. He said, I'm, I, I do want to sell my land. I said, well, will you sell it to us? He said, sure. I said, well, how much you want? He goes, well, how much you want to give? So I calculated quick in my mind. We were paying like, you know, $450,000 an acre by buying houses. I went, in the middle of town, I went, how about $70,000 an acre? That's five acres, $350,000. We'll give you $70,000 down, and every year, no interest, $70,000. He says, deal. I said, I'm a man of my word. I shook hands. He said, I'm a man of my word, too. Shook hands, and it happened, and we bought it. And we didn't even know what we needed it for. You know, we didn't know at that time. And then this land, in literally a year, when God gave me that vision, we bought seven houses here and built this. 
And since then, we've bought six more houses, and it's a miracle to build that down there, plus that parking lot. And let me tell you something, the last piece was a duplex, and I'd asked six or seven times that lady to summer that duplex. I didn't know the city was gonna make us put a lake over there for the retention pond. That's the biggest retention pond I've ever seen. And I didn't know, well we thought, we actually, the architect had finished the plans for that whole parking lot, he'd finished. And the duplex wasn't part of it because they kept telling us no. God spoke to me. I'm not kidding you. He said, call him one more time. And if it's my will to have it, you'll have it. I called and the lady, I about dropped my jaw. She said, sure, I'll sell it to you. I've decided to sell it. I said, what? So we bought that. And it, it, I mean, without it, it'd be a problem. I'm telling you right now, because we didn't know they were going to, we, we had pictured about a third of the retention pond they made us put in. I mean, Noah's Ark could be flooding right there and that thing still be okay. That's a huge so what I'm telling you, what am I telling you? Miracle after miracle after miracle. Last thing before you go. Last thing is that you saw the pastors talk about fasting and prayer 10 days. Three weeks ago, three weeks ago, I shared in my class a word I had for the church. And I said, I got a word for God from God for the church. And I said, and I don't know when I'm going to give it. I know I'm going to preach on the last Sunday of May. I think I might give it then. And I, I don't go to staff meeting. Pastor Jeff and those guys run the church. I don't. I don't even go. I just do relational stuff. Right? I'm still working full time in case you didn't know. Okay? But my word was this. Maybe you're fearful. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you're stuck. Maybe you're in the bondage of sin. Maybe you need deliverance. Maybe you need freedom. Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe you're depressed. Uh, maybe you got a loved one that needs a victory, needs a healing, needs this, needs that. Tell the people, if you fast 10 days, that God will hear and he will answer your prayer. And I didn't know until I read, just like you did, that they planned 10 days of fasting. And if you haven't started, it start today and go through next Wednesday. But start fasting. How do you fast? Well, I don't know. However God gives you to do. If you, it's maybe one meal a day. Maybe it's, but whatever you do, replace time with God for what you give up. You know? When I fasted four days, I heard God like he was in the room with me talking out loud. By that third and fourth day, because I'm telling you, I wasn't eating anything. I was drinking water, right? So I'm telling you, I challenge you. Let's start over. Let's go back to the roots. Let's hear God. Let's fast and pray. Let's be the church. Let's believe in the same God that has done miracle after miracle after miracle. And let's see God do something in the future because souls are been saved. Did you know that probably a, a, about 40% of the congregation that attends here now, I don't even know them. That's how many people have either come to Christ or come to this church because we don't compromise the truth. Pastor Jeff preaches on Easter morning about heaven and hell and about you got to repent and only Jesus can save your soul. We don't back down from saying what is true. And the reason... The gospel is powerless because it has a form of religion denying the power of God. The power of God is the Spirit taking the Word of God like a sharp sword and sticking it in to make people aware the only hope they have is Jesus. And if you're here and you need Jesus, would you cry out to Him? As we declare this God that has done a work in us, that did a work back in the days of Moses, that does, that does going to do the work in the future because He's the same God. Would you stand up and let's declare it and let's believe God before we go here this day if you're online and you need Jesus you don't have to understand it if you God knows what save me means if you sincerely say save me Jesus he will just like this lady down here baptized recently let me tell you something if you're here you may not understand it all but if you just sincerely say Jesus save me I want to be your child. I want to be in heaven. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just lift your head and say, Save me, Jesus. You would pray. Make that your prayer. Simple prayer. Save me, Jesus. Anybody here? Say, Save me, Jesus. Online. Save me, Jesus. Anybody? Father, I pray you save the, uh, those that need you. You're the same. You saved in the past. You saved me miraculously. I wept for days when I was saved. Didn't understand a thing about it other than come into my heart, Jesus. I pray, Lord, you do the same for everybody because you're the same God when I was eight. You're the same God. I'll be 69 still. And God, this whole thing is about you and then all, all the glory be to you that no man boasts that Jesus Christ be glorified. In Christ we pray. Amen. All right, for the 11 o'clock service, I want the computer guys back there to fix me, okay? I'm taking the whole thing about the donkey stuff out. I got to shorten this baby. No donkey talk. 
All right, God bless you. Have a great day, okay?